Out front tonight, the breaking news, the prosecution in Trump's criminal trial is about to resume its closing argument. They right now are in a very brief break, and it is continuing. We are now going into the evening as they try to get this done. The uh, prosecutor, Joshua Steinglass, has been speaking for nearly four hours. That's after the defense had gone for two and a half hours. It's been a long day. Steinglass, for the prosecution, right now laying out his case chronologically as he tries to dismantle Team Trump's arguments. So far, basically, they've tried to take five weeks of testimony from 22 witnesses and put it on an actual timeline. So that means David Pecker, Hope Pick, Stormy Daniels, and a lot of time, well over an hour today, spent on Michael Cohen. And the reason that Steinglass did that was that the defense in their closing statement, spend much of the time going after Trump's former fixer. Steinglass telling jurors, quote, we didn't choose Michael Cohen to be our witness. We didn't pick him up at the witness store. The defendant chose Michael Cohen as his fixer because he was willing to lie and cheat on his behalf, adding, this case is not about Michael Cohen. Well, that, of course, is the big question, whether the jury buys that or not. And according to people inside the courtroom, juries, jurors are paying close attention to Steinglass, uh, their eyes watching his every move, and the jurors also intently watching Trump's attorney as he tried to pin the entire case on Cohen and his lies, saying if you're if you if putting this on Cohen, you can't convict. At one point, uh, Blanche, uh, Trump's lawyer, listed every person that the defense says Cohen has lied to, and they listed his wife, his children, his coworkers, his banker of the Justice Department, and quote every single reporter he talked to for about a year. And then they tried to really lay it on thick, saying Michael Cohen is the gloat, literally the greatest liar of all time. That's what they want the jury to take away from this tonight. And the major question is how these closing arguments will affect the jury. Will they sway the men and women, seven men, five women, on Trump to convict or acquit? Paula Reed is out front live outside the courthouse to begin our coverage. And Paula, I was down there with today. I know you've been working uh, so much reporting here, and you've got some news from your sources on the Trump team. What are they telling you? Well, it's always been the belief that the likely best case scenario for the Trump team would be a mistrial here. But I'm told there are a lot of concerns that if the jury comes back and they are indeed deadlocked after they've done their, their deliberating over several hours or potentially days, that there is an instruction that the judge will give them. It's the so-called Allen charge. This is not special for the Trump trial. This is something that happens in New York State. But the concern on the Trump side is that once the jury gives this instruction, he will tell them, he will say, look, I want you to go back, continue to deliberate, and try to find some consensus, either to acquit or to convict. And there's a worry that that will apply some pressure. That the jurors will feel the weight of the historic nature of this case, all the resources that have been expended, and they might try to compromise and potentially convict Trump on some charges, like, for example, the checks that he signed. So obviously a mistrial is something that both sides want to avoid, which is why we heard today both sides trying to convince the jury to either acquit or convict. This is a dark day in America. We have a rigged court case that should have never been brought. Donald Trump's hush money trial entering its final phase today with closing arguments. Trump attorney Todd Blanche telling the jury the district attorney has not met their burden of proof, period maintaining Trump's innocence, saying it's a paper case, not about an encounter with Stormy Daniels 18 years ago that Trump has unequivocally and repeatedly denied. Blanche saying the hush money payments were not illegal and Trump was unaware. There's no evidence at all, not even a little bit of evidence that President Trump knew anything about these false filings. Zeroing in on the prosecution's key witness, Michael Cohen, sharply saying, Cohen lied to you. He's literally like an MVP of liars, Blanche remarked, telling the jury he lied to you, make no mistake about it, and later calling Cohen the gloat, greatest liar of all time. Blanche claiming Cohen was the human embodiment of reasonable doubt and that the jury should not convict based on his testimony. Blanche concluded his argument by telling the jury, you cannot send someone to prison. You cannot convict somebody based on the words of Michael Cohen. But that comment angered Judge Juan Marchand, who immediately admonished that comment as outrageous and highly inappropriate, later instructing the jury to disregard it, saying they could not discuss, consider, or even speculate as to matters related to a sentence or punishment. That is a job for the judge.
Then prosecutors kicked off their closing arguments playing cleanup. We didn't choose Michael Cohen to be our witness. We didn't pick him up at the witness store, Joshua Steinglass told the jury. Mr. Trump chose Mr. Cohen for the same qualities that his attorneys now urge you to reject his testimony, insisting it's a deflection for the defense to make the case about Cohen. Steinglass explained Cohen's role was just to be a tour guide through the physical evidence, but those documents don't lie and they don't forget. The prosecution then accused Trump and the publisher of the National Enquirer of trying to pull the wool over voters' eyes in a coordinated fashion. They didn't use the term catch and kill, but that's exactly what it was, Steinglass said. And that's the illegal part, because once money starts changing hands on behalf of a campaign, that's federal election campaign finance violations. This is not normal, legitimate press function, Steinglass remarked, calling it overt election fraud. Court continues uh, in the building right behind me. The judge just took the bench again after giving the jury a short break. Now, prosecutors have been going for four hours, and it's clear the judge is getting a little impatient with this. There's no time limit on closing arguments, but the judge just stopped prosecutors a short time ago, urged them to halt with an argument they were making about Stormy Daniels and just move on, citing the length so far of this closing argument. So, Aaron, it's unclear at this point how much longer they're going to go. Earlier, the judge had said that the jury was open to going as late as 8 o'clock. All right, Paula, thank you very much. And here we are, 707, and they're coming back into the courtroom, uh, and it's going to continue. All right, so uh, our experts are here. As they're coming back into the courtroom, I, I just want to start, Ryan, this um, Allen charge that Paula's breaking reporting here, this concern that the Trump team has, that as this wraps up tonight, that their biggest threat could be this Allen charge. I think that's right. Um, if I were them, I'd be very concerned about it because I think right now they're gunning for one or two jurors as the holdouts who then could hang, hang the jury. But if they get this kind of charge and they are forced to get a consensus of all the jurors agreeing, that puts the pressure on the ma supermajority of the jurors uh, being in favor of a conviction. It, so I think that's so right So basically they cave on, a, you know, the ones who would, would be the ones that would cause a mistrial would, would cave on a few. Counts. Especially if it's only one juror that's a holdout, they're much more willing to then bend to the supermajority. If it's two together, they might mm -hmm. bend together. But either way, that's not favorable to the defense when the jury gets that message. All right, and and, and this is, I mean, this is New York law, as yeah. Paula said, uh, but it does make you look at this a little differently. If you were trying to go to pick off one juror, it might change that calculus as they're sitting in that room tonight. So, Aaron, it could. Uh, now, obviously, it's premature, right? Because we don't know when the jury goes back. They may have a quick verdict, and it may be to quit. They may go back and have a quick verdict to convict. And so, until you get a jury that is somewhat deadlocked and are having real problems in making a determination, rendering a verdict, yep. that's when the dynamite charge comes out. And just very briefly, to be clear, the dynamite charge doesn't say to change your conscientious opinion. In fact, in the language itself, it says we're not asking you to do that. What we're telling you is that there's no jury who would be better than you, who would evaluate this case differently from you, who would take it more seriously than you. So go back there, do the best you can to not stay wedded to your view if there's an opinion that perhaps can move you out of it. And I think that is appropriate. It's been used, you know, throughout time. And I don't think it is, is something that should be overly concerning. All right. So the jury is coming back in the room right now. Mark O'Mara, let me just ask you about as Trump came in, and he came in before the jury. Uh, we saw, I don't know if we have the, the video here, but he gave a fist pump as he walked back in. Uh, and, and that was to, so you'll, you'll see it here. Uh, all right. Uh, now, you know, whether he... <laughs> Whether he's right or wrong is, is a separate point. But, Mark, do you think he's justified to do that at this point from what you've seen in these now close to seven hours of closing arguments? Well, any criminal defendant is not justified in doing that. But Mr. Trump has sort of shown himself not to be traditional in any form of fashion. So this fist pump was for the TV. It's for the election. It's for the audience. I, if my client ever did that, um, I would take him down a level. You cannot do that for any reason whatsoever, not to mention the jury, the judge might see it, court personnel might see it. It's just not the way you're supposed to act in a criminal courtroom, but um, former President Trump has never acted the way he was supposed to in most places, particularly not in this courtroom. 